range of motion, one of the most often misunderstood training variables. In fact, if you were to walk into the average commercial gym nowadays, you'd see different people performing the exact same exercise with different techniques, range of motion, and tempo. And if you're like most gym goers, you'd probably ask yourself why there's such wide variety among these factors between lifters. And you'd probably also wonder whether or not there is a correct or optimal way to perform each exercise to maximize muscle growth and strength gains. Well, Lucky for you, in this video, we're going to dive into the literature and answer these exact questions. Starting off with some brief definitions, range of motion is defined as the degree of movement at a joint when performing an exercise, and tempo is defined as the rate at which you perform each individual phase of an exercise. So when it comes to range of motion, the most common question I hear is whether or not we should train with a full range of motion or a partial range of motion. And thankfully, the literature seems to, in a very general sense, be pretty clear on this. A recent meta-analysis analyzing 23 studies and examining the effects of range of motion on strength, hypertrophy, power, body composition, and sport performance outcomes found that, in general, using a full range of motion is more beneficial, however trivial in magnitude, for all of these outcomes. So does this mean that using a full range of motion all of the time is the be-all end-all when it comes to the elusive range of motion debate? And the short answer is... No, not at all. The long answer, however, is of course a bit more nuanced. For example, as some of you may know, when making exercise selection or when performing exercises, there has been a recent insurgence of lifters who make a big deal about whether or not a exercise takes you through a given muscle's length and position, which leads us to wonder whether partials at different muscle lengths may yield different outcomes rather than just lumping all partials into the same category. Not only that, as I hope we all know, Everyone goes to the gym for different reasons. Some people may be training for hypertrophy, some people may be training for strength, and others may be training specifically to get good at partial ranges of motion. Which, of course, begs the question of whether or not full range of motion is the best for all goals. So, starting with strength goals, over the years, the fitness community as a whole has come to realize that strength adaptations aren't solely dependent on how much contractile tissue you carry, but they tend to also be dependent on a principle of specificity. And if you were to ask the average powerlifter how you can set up your training to increase your one rep max on a squat, they'll probably just respond by saying, squat more. And in a sense, they're right. The more you perform a specific movement or numerous different movements that are quite similar, the better strength adaptations you seem to gain through not only an increase in contractile tissue in that movement's prime movers, but also through neural adaptations and an increase in specific motor skills. So for example, if your goal was to get better at partial squats, you should perform lots of partial squats. And of course, following this logic, we'd assume that in pretty much every case, performing the specific task will be the best way to get you better at that specific task. However, when we look at the literature, we kind of find mixed results. For example, a 2013 study by Bloomquist and colleagues split 17 subjects into two groups. One group trained deep squats for 12 weeks at 0 to 120 degrees of knee flexion, while the other group trained shallow squats for 12 weeks at 0 to 60 degrees of knee flexion. During the study, they assessed pre and post strength, jump performance, muscle architecture, and cross-sectional area. And as you can see here, deep squats outperformed the shallow squat group when looking specifically at the squat jump and the counter movement jump. However, a 2016 study by Ray and colleagues split 28 men into three training groups over a 16-week training intervention. A quarter squat group, a half squat group, and a full squat group. Strength methods were conducted on all three depths, as well as vertical jump and 40-yard sprint time, all at pre-, mid-, and post-training. And when looking at the vertical jump performance, we find the opposite findings of the Bloomquist study. Quarter and half squats resulted in superior gains of mid and post training vertical jump performance, which, following the principle of specificity, makes most sense. To quote an excerpt from the Mass Research Review, at least in a vacuum, one should anticipate that partial squats would be more effective for promoting gains in jump height because the joint angles of a vertical jump more closely mimic the joint angles of a partial squat. Not many drop into a full squat position when attempting to jump as high high as possible. Now, the main differences between these two studies was that the training status of the subjects in Bloomquist study was performed on essentially untrained subjects, whereas the Rea study was performed on collegiate athletes with at least two years of training experience and a 1RM squat of at least 1.5 times body weight. So the trend in the literature seems to suggest that specificity is king for performance adaptations in studies that consist mainly of trainees who already have a decent amount of training experience and have at least a decent amount of muscle on their frame. 
However, in the studies that consisted of untrained or barely trained individuals, doing a full range of motion seems to be better for performance regardless of previous assumptions about specificity. Now, the reason for these results isn't 100% clear, however, they may be better understood when we take into account that full range of motion seems to yield greater hypertrophy. Therefore, in trainees with less muscle, we can assume that the benefits of a superior increase in contractile tissue outweighs the motor skill and other benefits of specificity at that stage in their lifting career. However, However, you must also keep in mind that when doing full squats, you're still training the entire partial range of motion, so you will still see some benefits from specificity. That, coupled with the benefits of more hypertrophy, may explain why relatively untrained individuals experience better performance with full range of motion training. However, again, this is a guess to explain a tentative observation, so we're still yet to say with confidence what may be happening here and why. And with that in mind, I'd like to also mention that most of these studies are short term and only put trainees through a few months of training. Therefore, it may be possible that even in the well-trained individuals, full range of motion might eventually be better long term for all goals since it takes longer to see large hypertrophy outcomes in groups with a more advanced training status. And speaking of hypertrophy outcomes, let's dive into the hypertrophy side of the range of motion debate. Namely, are partials always worse for hypertrophy or is there merit to partials at certain muscle lengths? Well, thankfully, the Meta looked at this question as well and seemed to indicate that training with long muscle length partials was better for hypertrophy than both short muscle length partials and full range of motion reps. Now, these findings are significant and some may find them to be quite surprising, and for that reason, I'd say there's no real problem with being slightly skeptical. However, personally, I see this as the data pointing towards long muscle length partials being at least around equal to full range of motion for hypertrophy and likely even better. So, now that we see the data pointing to training with long muscle length partials being best, we may wonder, does this mean that it's very specifically doing partials at long muscle lengths yielding superior outcomes, or will full range of motion sets of exercises that you put your muscle through a lengthened position also yield superior hypertrophy outcomes? And to answer this question, we need to look at studies that compare exercises with the same range of motion, but with both a short and comparatively longer muscle length, which thankfully is easily done when training biarticular muscles, which are muscles that cross two joints, such as certain heads of the hamstrings, triceps, and calves. Which brings us onto a recent study by Mao and colleagues which examined the impact of seated versus lying leg curls on hamstring hypertrophy. Using a within-subject unilateral design on 20 subjects, each subject trained one leg with a lying hamstring curl with the hips extended, resulting in a short muscle length on all heads of the hamstrings. Their other leg, however, performed a seated leg curl with their hips flexed, effectively resulting in a longer muscle length on all three biarticular heads of the hamstrings, namely the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and long head of the biceps femoris. However, both legs employed the same range of motion at the knee, 90 degrees of knee flexion. And as you can see here, the researchers observed a greater increase in hypertrophy on all three biarticular heads. Not only that, they also observed similar hypertrophy on the biceps femoris short head, which is the only monoarticular head, meaning it only crosses the knee and therefore was not at a longer muscle length with either variation. And even in more support for the long muscle length training, the sartorius, which is a knee flexor and hip flexor, experienced more growth with the lying leg curl, where it was most lengthened due to hip extension. And if that's not enough evidence, we can look at a more recent study, again by Mao and colleagues, in which they again employ a within-subject unilateral design, with subjects training one arm in the overhead position, effectively resulting in a longer muscle length on the triceps longhead, while their other arm was training a triceps pushdown, meaning no triceps head was particularly lengthened. And of course, in both conditions, the subjects trained through the same elbow range of motion, 90 degrees of elbow flexion, and this study again found that training the long head of the triceps in a long muscle length position with the overhead tricep extension resulted in superior growth of the long head of the triceps. Now, we don't exactly know the mechanisms behind why this seems to be the case, and for now the possible reasons are plenty, and frankly, it's likely to be more than one mechanism causing this. So, until more research comes out with the specific goal of testing the possible mechanisms, I wouldn't be confident enough to bet on any one of the possibilities. And if, like me, you're a long muscle length enthusiast, you shouldn't justify your position in the long muscle length camp with any assumption behind a mechanism that might be causing these benefits, since assuming any one mechanism would turn out to, at best, 
test be only slightly accurate and likely incomplete, and at worst can result in downstream complete disinformation. So the question now is, with all this information in mind, what are some practical takeaways for both people with mainly strength and performance goals and for people with mainly hypertrophy goals? Well, as discussed previously in the video, when it comes to strength and performance goals, generally you want to use full range of motion reps most of the time. But I say most of the time because we live in the real world where you can use both partial reps and full range of motion reps. Not only that, we also tend to train for longer than most studies run for. So what works in a short-term study design might not work in the real world where we train for the long term. This means that if your main goal is to increase performance in the partial range of motion over the long term, you should train with partials for specificity. However, majority of your work should be performed with a full range of motion given that hypertrophy will help along with specificity long term. However, if your main goal is to increase partial range of motion performance in the short term, you should again use both full range of motion and partial range of motion with equal to majority of your training being done in the partial range of motion. And lastly, if your main goal is to build strength in the full range of motion, you should do a majority of your work in the full range of motion for specificity. However, you still may benefit from mixing in some partials. Personally, my recommendations would be to specifically incorporate partials in the range of motion you feel is hardest for you, which thankfully most of the time happens to be in the lengthened position, which is the most hypertrophic part of the exercise. And as for hypertrophy recommendations, generally you should perform most, if not all of your exercises through the longest range of motion you safely and comfortably can. And it it should result in a near maximal hypertrophy. However, if you'd like to absolutely maximize hypertrophy, or at least try to, when designing your program, you can specifically select exercises that allow you to, within reason, safely and comfortably train your target muscle through the longest possible muscle lengths. I'd like to also mention that subbing exercises out for long muscle length partials, or simply including long muscle length partials as a sort of intensity technique after reaching failure is also a viable option and may even help with keeping your workouts interesting. For one example, I thoroughly enjoy doing long muscle length partials after reaching failure on almost all of my arm work. And lastly, I'd also like to mention that including a long muscle length focused tempo, like the tempo I usually always recommend of holding in the lengthened position for two to three seconds, followed by a explosive concentric one to two second pause in the contracted position and ending with a slow and controlled eccentric before repeating, just might be beneficial for hypertrophy, as well as a isometric hold in the lengthened position for 30 seconds to a minute between each set or after your last set might also be beneficial. But the evidence on these are lacking, and for that reason, it's things I usually focus on using specifically for my weak points, like my chest and calves. So with all of this new information in mind, I hope you can use it and see some of the best gains you ever have. What's going on guys? I'd like to thank you all so much for making it this far into the video. And I'd also like to mention that I put a lot of time and effort into making the video. So if you liked it and found the information in this video useful, don't be afraid to drop a like and share the video if you know someone else who might also like it. I'd really, really, really appreciate it. Again, it took a while to condense all this research into an entertaining and digestible form, so it would be very, very much appreciated. Other than that, if you guys like the information in the video and want to get more quality information like this, don't forget to subscribe. And with that, I'll be seeing you guys in my next video. Peace.